Hey guys, I want to do a video today on neo-nomianism and point out this false teaching and what it leads people to believe. And uh, basically, this word means a new law. And what I want to do, I want to look at a couple of articles, read some things out of these that define neo-nomianism really well. And then add some comments and thoughts to that and show scripture to try to, um, you know, get a good teaching out of this. And so l let's just go to what neo-nomianism means. And basically, like I said, it means a new law. And it teaches that the first law of God or the Mosaic law could not be followed properly by anyone save Jesus Christ. Therefore, in order for people to be saved from their sins, that... The law of grace was instituted by God, and this new law of grace had different obligations than the old Mosaic law, where perfect obedience was required for this. Um, and so the new requirements of the gospel of the good news are faith in Jesus Christ and repentance from sins. So basically... Turning from sins and keeping a new set of laws and commands. Um, and so, first of all, you know, people who teach neo-nomianism and that Jesus brought in a new set of laws and commands for us to follow in order to receive eternal life will teach that people prior to the cross were saved by the old law. And the adherence of the old law and will often fall into the trap that you know although they know that there was never perfect obedience to the law on either side of the cross whatever the law they're talking about um, that by sincerely doing and following the mosaic law and sacrificing bulls and goats and calves that their sins were forgiven because of being sincere in trying to be obedient to the law that God instituted for that generation. And so in the same sense, they will look at the other side of the cross as we're under similar obligations of showing our faith by our actions and our sincerity and our obedience and doing the best we can, as well as having faith in order to receive eternal life. And so, you know, neonomianism summed up is the idea that Christ has by his atonement lowered the requirements of the law that mere endeavor is accepted in room of perfect obedience. Uh, so you'll see people that teach, you know, these works-based salvation and that you have to be obedient to God and they'll say, well, we know that we're not in perfect obedience. Nobody's in perfect obedience. We're not teaching that. We just teach that you have to willfully turn from your sins and you have to willfully keep God's commandments as best you can. And when you slip up or you don't follow God's commandments, then God's grace kicks in. But in order to receive that grace, you must be following God's commandments to the best of your ability. And so, you know, obviously this is counter to the teachings of the Bible where, you know, neonomianism says that a sinful heart of man is sufficient for salvation by our trying, though not perfectly, to keep the new law that has two requirements now, faith and repentance of sins. Um, therefore, it teaches salvation by faith and keeping the law because sin is a transgression of the law. And we're talking about the moral law. We're not talking about the Mosaic law. Um, and so when you see, and we'll look at those verses, such as in Galatians and Romans, where it talks about the law, we're talking about the moral law, God's commands, not the Mosaic law with all the Levitical priesthood and those things. Um, you know, and, and I don't think anybody teaches that now, except maybe some Hebrews roots movement heretics that, 
you know, will try to get back under the Mosaic law and teach that you have to do all those things, including keeping the Sabbath and, um, you know, and, and following holy days and these religious um, ceremonies and observances in order to either um, get salvation, keep salvation, or show that you have salvation, um, which is absolutely false. Um, but this video isn't about Hebrews Roots Movement. It's about neo-nomianism. It's about looking at Jesus and having a sort of twisted sense of what his purpose is. Um, you know, it's an insufficient understanding of the person and the work of Christ regarding the atonement, his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, Jesus fulfilled the law, the law that we couldn't keep, something that was impossible for us to do. And as I said many times, you know, the law was established. You know, we're talking about the moral law, the law that's written on our hearts, you know, knowing good from bad. That's established showing that we could never keep these perfect attributes of God and therefore lead us to Christ. And then the Mosaic law, as it says in Galatians, was brought in because of transgressions. It was to further show our sin and our guilt because of sin so that we would not trust in the law and our righteousness, but relinquish trusting in our righteousness and put our trust in God, his righteousness, his obedience. That's what the law has always been there to do, to turn us from trusting in ourselves or whatever else that we're falsely trusting in, trusting in God and his promises, the Lamb of God, the finished work of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, so just continuing with this theme of neo-nomianism, again, it, people that teach this, they admit that we can't fully obey the law of God. Um, so they'll argue that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection satisfied the old law, but now a new law is brought in, you know, which has grace tied to it, but you also have to be in obedience to his commands as best as you can. And just be sincere, although we know we're going to be imperfect. In other words, Jesus, through his death, has lowered the bar of God's laws to make it easier for us to obey and merit his favor in order to receive eternal life. And you can see how this teaching is in error. Um, you know, in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The plan of salvation has always been the same for all generations throughout all ages. It's to trust in the Redeemer, to trust in the promise of God, and that He would fulfill what we could not, and to place our trust in His redemptive work. You know, before the cross, people were trusting in a Redeemer to come to save them from their sins and overcome death for them. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in life eternal. These were all promises of God that they put their trust in. They just didn't, didn't know the name of Jesus Christ. They weren't following another law or their Mosaic law in order to receive eternal life. They're doing the same thing we do today, placing our faith in God through the person of Jesus Christ. And our faith is counted as righteousness. It was done back then. It's done the same way today. Um, you know, so Let's just go to some scriptures. And Matthew 5, 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Obviously, this is Jesus speaking. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And then goes on, Whosoever shall therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the king of heaven. kingdom of heaven. So, you know, Jesus is teaching uh, here, and this is, this is right here, the Sermon on the Mount, right after the Beatitudes, showing that it's his righteousness that we must obtain to enter the kingdom of God. That our righteousness is going to be imperfect. 
And the scribes and Pharisees who thought that they had perfect righteousness were doing all the right things, he was pointing to them that their righteousness isn't perfect. You have to exceed that, and you can't. Therefore, trust in me, who fulfilled the law, who fulfilled the prophets um, and their prophecies in the Psalms. You know, and it, if we go into Luke 4, when Jesus was reading um, the book of Isaiah in the synagogue, in verse 17 it says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them who are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto him, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And so he was showing that he fulfilled prophecy. And he was quoting and reading out of Isaiah, um, which we find at the beginning of Isaiah 61. At the end of um, the book of Luke, after his resurrection, Jesus on the road to Emmaus told the two disciples that were with him, starting in verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Uh, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Uh, and then goes on, you know, after he arrived um, to Emmaus and sat down with him to sat down with them to eat, and you know, he broke bread and uh, blessed it, and then their eyes were open, and then he vanished, and then they said, you know, in verse thirty-two. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? So, you know, he was constantly showing um, people before and after his resurrection that scripture was fulfilled in him. The law was fulfilled in him. Um, you know, the law was the, the Old Testament was the perfect attributes that testified to who God was his righteousness, his perfectness. Um, and it showed that we weren't righteous, that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We're not perfect. We're totally imperfect. We're corruptible flesh, and we need a Savior. Um, you know, and then the New Testament was God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, um, and his birth, and his ministry and his sinless life and then his death and burial and resurrection that testified to the one true god who he was we saw who he was through the old testament um and the perfect attributes of the law but we also see him in the person of jesus christ in luke 24 finishing up the the book jesus said to his uh, disciples these are the words which i spake unto you this is verse 44 while i was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto him, Thus it is written, and thus it's behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power of them on high. So, repentance is not turning from sin right here. It's turning to faith in Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, um, which leads to a spiritual baptism by the Holy Spirit as a believer is incorporated into the body of Christ at the time of a believer's spiritual birthday. Um, that's how we're incorporated in the body of Christ, through faith, uh, through trusting in his redemptive, completed work on the cross, and that he overcame death for us through his resurrection. Um, and this has always been the plan of salvation. You know, getting back to the book of Romans, for instance, in Romans 4, you know, where it says, Starting in verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh this 
reward, not reckon of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So this this passage is talking about how Abraham's works of righteousness did not contribute to his salvation, to his eternal life. And it wasn't works of the law because he wasn't under the law. You know, the law came 430 years after Abraham. That's when the Mosaic law was established. So we're talking about another law here. Uh, Abraham received the promises of God through faith, and it was counted to him for righteousness. His circumcision didn't um, allow him to achieve eternal life or be merited eternal life. His offering up of Isaac didn't. Um, it was his faith that was counted as righteousness. Then he went on and matured in the faith and fulfilled the promises that he would be the seed that the lineage of Christ and believers would be in, uh, that he would be the father of many nations, and that his seed would be uh, more numerous than the stars of heaven that are seeing us on the shore. That was what was fulfilled through his actions, through his perfect faith, his mature faith. But all he needed was faith of a mustard seed to be saved. And that was accomplished when he believed God and it was counted him for righteousness, um, not through his actions. And, you know, and that's always been the case in the Mosaic Law. We read in Habakkuk uh, 2.4, the just shall live by faith. You know, that's how um, people in the Old Testament were saved, through faith in the Redeemer to come, trusting in God's promises. And we see the just shall live by faith quoted many times in the New Testament. It was showing the same thing that led to salvation on both sides of the cross. Um, you know, in Galatians, if you look at Galatians 3, you know, this really summarizes it well, you know, because it talks about... Um, Abraham and the old covenant and the promises of God and leads into um, works of righteousness and following the law that they do not contribute to salvation, never have. In Galatians 3, 6, it says, even as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, that's a Gentile nation. Um, so the children of Israel, as well as the Gentiles, have always been justified by faith. Uh, but it goes on, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. So the gospel is preached unto Abraham. I mean, the gospel was preached unto Moses. <laughs> you know, Christ was preached, as we see in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter was preached to Moses. Moses knew the Messiah, the Christ, to come and knew that that was what he was placing his faith in for eternal life, to receive the promises of God. Abraham knew the same thing because the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ was preached to him also. Uh, 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, man, you know, God manifest in the flesh and the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, it goes on in verse 9, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And then continues, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law on the side of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So <laughs> there's Paul quoting in Galatians. He does it elsewhere too. Habakkuk 2.4, showing that the Mosaic law, as well as the law of the moral law that has always been part of man's conscience and knowing right from wrong, you know, since the uh, creation and the knowledge of the tree of good and evil in Adam and Eve's time, you know, we have had that conscience uh, and the knowledge of sin. And just like Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, which could have been from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were naked and trying to cover themselves with the same thing that conven condemned them, that couldn't save them. You know, the law. 
But the Lord made a way for Adam and Eve and sacrificed what I think was a lamb, showing the sacrificial lamb of God would cover our sins. And he covered them physically with a coat of animal skins. But from a spiritual sense, it was Jesus' imputed righteousness that clothed them. And they received it by faith. It's been the same since the beginning. Um, and so sorry to get on that tangent. Let's get back to Galatians. Um, and, you know, verse 12, And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curses to everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham, so we're back to Abraham before the Mosaic law, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promises, promise of the Spirit through faith. So, you know, and then goes on now to in verse 16, and now to Abraham is seed where the promise is made, he saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. You know, and we can just read the rest of Galatians, just read Galatians 3, you know, um, for you know, in verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise, and down to verse 29. And if you be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, you know, Isaac was the son of promise, you know, and we're sons of promise through Abraham's seed through faith in Jesus Christ, not by establishing our own righteousness, not by following the law through our obedience. Um, because it's imperfect obedience. And God requires perfect obedience. You know? Um, it's not our righteousness or obedience. Just like in Romans 5, 18 and 19. It's the righteousness of one. It's the obedience of one. It's Jesus Christ and his righteousness. His obedience that leads to justification. Through faith in him. That's justification of life. You know, what he did shall many be made righteous, not what we do. Um, and going to Romans, you know, Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do and that it was wheat through the flesh, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. That's Jesus Christ that it's talking about. Um, you know, it says... Well, I'll just let you read the rest of Galatians. I mean, we could we could read this and go on, but hopefully I've made my point. Hopefully you see this teaching um, that neonomianism is a false teaching and it leads to a false gospel, uh, that you're trusting in your obedience and you're turning from your sins, although imperfect, you just have to be willingly or willing to turn from sins um, and then have faith in Jesus Christ. But that's not how it works, you know? Um, if it's by grace and it's no more of works, as it says in Romans eleven six, you know, so just to summarize, you know, thankfully in the Bible, the gospel is not a new law for us to follow because nobody could follow the law, whether it was written on our hearts, whether it was the Mosaic law or anything else. Nobody could follow it perfectly through our sincere efforts. Nobody save Jesus Christ has ever been able to fulfill the law. So, you know, the gospel is the good news. You know, that's bad news that we have to follow a law that we can't in order to attain eternal life. That's not good news. That's impossible. But what's impossible for man is possible for, by, for God. You know, and that's through the person of Jesus Christ. You know, it's Christ that's obeyed the law on our behalf and led that sinless life and paid for our sins. Um, through his atoning death on the cross. You know, the gospel is not a message of what we have to sincerely try to do. It's the gospel is what Jesus Christ has already done for us. So rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ and don't get caught up in neonomianism or any other type of lordship salvation, which will add works uh, and call it grace. You know, they'll say, well, you have to have obedience to God's commandments in order to receive God's grace. 
Well, you just made that a wage and changed the definition of grace, which is unmerited favor. So don't try to merit unmerited favor, but rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's how to become a child of God.